Uh oh. <laughs> oh, good morning. Welcome back. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you who enjoyed uh, the, the uh, events last night. I think we all uh, found the caricatures really fascinating to watch uh, and then to see what she did with you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to, uh, I just want to make uh, my regular pitch. You'll get this four or five more times today. Uh, when you uh, depart, make sure you drop off your uh, evaluation form. This is uh, really important input uh, to us uh, in looking forward. And uh, please, uh, this is a, would be a good place to note uh, your suggestions for the, the drill down topics we might treat uh, at the, uh, the spring uh, US meeting. Uh, as I described yesterday, we're thinking about uh, having a more focused uh, meeting on just a few topics. That would be great. Uh, our first speaker this morning uh, is Neil Christensen uh, from the University of California Press. And I'm always looking for interesting new twists on the concept of a journal or a serial publication. And uh, the, the UC Press, uh, which means University of California Press to those of us in, in California, uh, has really invested pretty significantly uh, in uh, bringing in people who can generate uh, sharp new ideas and then get them out into the, the hands of the, uh, the researchers. And, and Neil and his colleagues have, have done a couple of these, uh, and he's going to talk about one in particular that's now up and running. And I thought it would be interesting just to, to hear about. I've only known one or two of you who have done something uh, similar. Neil? Neil? Just discovered there may be an issue, um, but I'll see if we can work it out. So uh, there, there was supposed to be a, a, a demo element, um, but um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, it is. That's what I just sort of thought about right now. Um, now, nah, anyway, let's let's see how we go. Can we swap you with another speaker and you can arrange that? It's good. All righty. No, we're good. Okay. Whew. All righty. Um, well, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, to speak here today. Um, as, uh, as John said, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, a couple of, uh, of initiatives at, at UC Press that are both uh, sort of focused on, on, broadening, uh, on broadening impact and, 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 and broaden the relevance of, of, of the knowledge that, uh, that we help provide. The, the first one is uh, case studies in the environment. This is a, a peer-reviewed journal with case study uh, articles, um, and I'll give you, if everything goes okay, I'll give you a demo uh, on, on this journal. We, we launched it in, in May, and I'll show you a bit about how, how this uh, product works. Um, and then at the end, I'll talk a bit about some of the experiences we've, we've had with this, uh, with this journal since we, uh, since we launched. The, the second one uh, is also a peer-reviewed journal, uh, but, but this is one with, uh, with, with annotations around the, uh, around the articles. It's not something we've launched yet. We had, we've had a very long runway on this, uh, on this, on this project, um, and the most recent update is we found an editor for it finally, uh, and then the uh, editor uh, put a delay on it because he's stepping down as dean of his school, so it's delayed until next year sometime. But, um, so I can't show you a demo, but I can take you through some, uh, some charts to sort of explain how, uh, how this model would, would work. Both these, uh, these models are intended for expansion, right? So when it says case studies in environment, the idea is that we do that as a pilot, and then we have ideas for case studies, in, and you can fill in the blank. Uh, and we already have uh, two candidates uh, in, in, in the pipeline in collaboration with, uh, with two schools in the, in the UC system. Uh, and there should be more news on at least one of them uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then the, the third one, uh, yeah, we'll see sometime later in the, in the fall. Uh, the same with Global Perspectives. We have an idea for uh, a sister product there as well, uh, but we just want to launch this first one before we even uh, start entertaining that. So let's get to it. Let's go here. So as I said, uh, Case Studies Environment is really, it's, it's a peer-reviewed journal. 
and, and you'll see more when we go into the, into the demo. And it consists in, in its most simple form of articles that are case studies um, with uh, some complementary information around them that is sort of learning or education focused, right? So slides, case study questions, learning outcomes, syllabi, uh, curriculum, teaching notes, there's no limitation there. And, and we see quite a variety on, on what information comes with uh, the, the, the different uh, cases. Uh, there is also an opportunity to publish slides independently, and we'll talk a bit about that, and I'll uh, give you a, a, a demo of that. So um, let's just get uh, right to it, if you can go in there. So do I give you uh, instructions on what to click? Ah, let's go back. Let's see what happened there. Hmm. No? <laughs> There's always something. How much longer do you, do, do you need? Should, should I? Two minutes? Um, yeah, I guess so. I guess I could skip ahead to some of the experiences we've had, and then I can give you the, uh, the, the, the demo. So let's just uh, uh, power on. Experiences to, uh, to, to date. So we, we launched in, in May, right? And um, I mean, what we found prior was that case studies are highly used in, uh, in environmental sciences and, and studies, right? But they're poorly organized and they're fairly poorly vetted. You know, for many people, the case is uh, it's just a good story, right? And for others, uh, it's more like a, you know, fully written up thing with, with all the sort of pedagogical uh, tools and complements that you would expect with it. Um, what we've seen in, in the submissions is very similar to that. Um, there, you're good? Then let me get back to that and go straight into the demo, because it'll make more sense uh, after we've looked at some of this stuff um, to, to talk about it. So, um, you good there? So here it is. Uh, it is basically just a, a peer review journal. Um, if you go into read, you can go into read and pick uh, environmental law policy and management. You'll see we have different sections. So it's really a, an interdisciplinary journal. We uh, publish anything from, uh, from the fields of conservation biology over law, policy, energy, uh, to sustainability. And then try and go down. Let's see. If you scroll down, let's go all the way to the bottom. It's a list of upcoming stuff, latest content. Let's try and go further down. There's a favorite case I think will illustrate some of this pretty well. Further down, probably all the way at the bottom maybe. Of course, at the bottom. That one, impact of land use activities in the Maumee River. Try and pick that. Uh, so here you have it. And if you scroll down a bit, you'll see uh, the, 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 the cases are really organized like articles, right? But you have certain sections uh, that, that add some uniformity, right? There's uh, uh, sections on learning outcomes, whether it's been classroom tested and any uh, any, any notes on, on the experience with that. Uh, there was a case examination uh, chapter, case study questions. And then you really, you, you can freestyle as an author in, in terms of which other compliments you want to add. So if you go up to the top, let's have a look at some of those. So if you go into uh, supplemental, the supplemental tab to the right of article, you see right there, that's the one, yeah? And uh, try and, uh, and pick uh, slides. So the, the, the slides vary in size. We, we try to make authors limit them, but we've, you know, we've received submissions of like 250 megabyte uh, slide decks that we had to work with authors to, to reduce. Uh, and, and, but most of them are more like in the, in the nine to 10 to, to 20 uh, megs uh, size. Let's see what happens here. So, this is a, um, if you just, uh, yeah, and you can just scroll through it. This is a, so this case 
is a case that can be taught over, uh, over eight classes. You can also divide it into uh, you know, single classes if you want. And the authors have provided you know, a full slide set for all eight classes. So you can go in and you can pick whatever you, you want. If there are particular aspects you want to, you want to teach, if you want to, if you want to riff or hack the, the slides, you can do that uh, uh, and, and create your own slides. Just uh, you know, provide uh, an acknowledgement, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we, we we see different things with different authors, right? So some authors uh, feel there's some IP around the slides and they don't want to share them, while others are very happy to share them. And and it's it's a new journal, right? So we. We're not really trending too much on, on that right now. Some, some share slides and some don't. It's a, it's a bit up and down. So if you go out of that uh, and, and then back to the article, let's have a look at the other, let's see, there we go. Perfect, and then there's teaching notes. So if you try and take teaching notes, have a look at that. So that's a, also a supplementary file, right? It's a Word document, so it's at the bottom there. So the, these are teaching notes. So they're, they're focused on, on helping the, the, the instructor that decides to use this case uh, sort of think about uh, how to use the case in, in, in the class. You know, and it can include various activities. It can include syllabi. There's, there's, there's a lot of sort of flexibility on, on what you can include in, in these teaching notes. Uh, but again, right here you have like a set of teaching notes for 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 a full semester of a, of, of a course. Um, yeah, just an example. So I think we can go back to the uh, back to the to the website again. Oh, uh, to the website. Sorry, guys. After we're out of the demo, it'll become a bit more streamlined. But I thought it would be nice to to show to actually show something concrete. Now, oh, I'll try and go back into that article, though. Yeah. And then scroll down. All the content is organized oh, a bit up again. A bit up, a bit up, a bit up, 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 up. There, stop. So all the content is, uh, is, is organized with a fixed taxonomy. Right, so we work with the editorial team to come up with some way of organizing this where when authors uh, submit, right, they have to sort of uh, tag their content with our fixed taxonomy. So, you know, and, and the topics are, you know, what's the educational use cases for this content? What sections are they in? What's the general topic? Um, which geographical uh, area uh, is, is it relevant to? Um, so if you pick, for instance, a classroom tested over there under subjects, that one, yeah, that will bring up a, a, a cohort of, of all the cases that have been classroom tested, right? And as an educator, that's nice to know how someone actually used this in class before. Um, and if you go down, maybe just scroll all the way to the bottom, I have a feeling the one I want to look at is all the way at the bottom. Yeah, further, it's probably all the way down. Ah, here, energy and society, try and pick that. Uh, so, so this is an opportunity to look at a, another article type that we have. So the first we, we looked at was sort of a, a more classic article. Uh, another article type we have, our content type, is slides, right? So you can uh, publish your slides as uh, supplementary information to your article case, but you could also just want to share slides that you already have, right? So uh, some people have hundreds of, of, of slides lying around that they've ac accumulated, and some of those actually present a case in a, in a, in a fairly uh, concise manner. So uh, during the market research for this, right, we, we had a lot of people say, ah, oh, you know, uh, for me, a, a case is really just a, a, a slide set, and if you gave me an opportunity to submit slides, then I'd probably go in and, and, and uh, upload some slides uh, today. Um, so uh, if you go in here, you go into, uh, if try and scroll down a bit, I'm not quite sure which, uh, if it'll show in this browser. Ah, so there you go. So you can download the, the slides separately, right, or you can also view them in line. Uh, and uh, again, the slide sets vary. One interesting thing here, if you go into that uh, cited by, right there at the bottom, cited by that one, 
right, and you click uh, Google Scholar, right there. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, this is, I don't know of any other examples, at least it's the first one I know of, right, but slides are now being indexed by Google Scholar through this. Right, so what do we do? We take a slide, we add an abstract, we, we have some editorial vetting, uh, we put on some, some keywords, and now slides could actually uh, start being found in, in Google Scholar. Um, and I think, I mean, that, that gives you a, a, a general sense of what case studies in the in environment uh, uh, is. Uh, maybe we'll go back to the experiences, so we can jump back to the, uh, back to the slides that get out of this, uh, this mess. There, so experiences to date. Um, so I said we started in May. Um, so far we have, we have a, a, an author universe that we've been in contact with that have given us some indication that they're interested of, of roughly 300 authors, of which roughly half, so 150, have confirmed that they're gonna submit at some prospective date within the next uh, uh, six to 12 months. Uh, and roughly half of those that said that they were gonna submit have already uh, submitted. So it's sort of like a sort of conversion funnel that's 50-50-50. Um, the, uh, the, the, the types of authors that, that this journal is, is attracting is, is, is fairly diverse. It includes uh, researchers, but it also includes uh, people who are you know, recently minted uh, PhDs or adjuncts, people who have a, a, a big teaching load who don't necessarily have access to, to research funding, right? but have a lot of knowledge about teaching a particular topic and maybe have like a favorite case that they've been teaching for years, right? So they have their own expertise. So for, for them, this is, a, this is an avenue uh, to, to publish, right? Because they, they may not be, you know, uh, supportive enough to actually do research. But we also have researchers who publish research articles and then turn around and say, well, part of the requirement for my research grant was that I need to broaden the impact. And, and one way of broadening the impact is to, is to turn all this accumulated knowledge that I published in research articles into more of an, an educational module or an educational uh, object. And I could do that through a case study. And so we have a mix of authors there. I, I don't know what, what, what the ratio is. Maybe it's 50-50. It's, it's um, but we definitely, you know, we, we definitely see a high level of interest uh, amongst, uh, amongst people who we wouldn't normally be in contact with because they don't have access to its research grants. But the content is still fully vetted. It's uh, externally peer reviewed, right? So uh, the, the, the quality is, is good. Um, other things, experiences here, yeah. So as I said, we, uh, we, want, to, we want to extend this, right? So we, we have some ideas for other publications, right, that without giving too much away, right, are sort of in the scope of uh, public policy, urban planning, social work, uh, global health um, that we're looking into. Um, and, uh, you know, we have some experience, of course, with setting this up. You, you, when you're trying to do many new things at once, right, it's always a challenge. It's okay trying to do one new thing, but then when you want to, you know, overlay that and do two or three new things, it, it, it actually becomes a, a, a lot of work. And a lot of work went into Sort of working with the editors to figure out, well, what is this? You know, what is this goal? What is a, a, a good case? And how do we go about soliciting this? And who are our, our sort of target authors? A lot of work went into that. So for the, for the twin publications, the sister publications, we decided let's go out and find some partners, right? And we at UC Press, we all often talk about, you know, that we're part of the University of California, of course, and we need to find ways of leveraging that. And, uh, and so we started going to, uh, to some of the schools in some of the target areas and say, hey, you know, you're an educational institution. You should be interested in this, right? Your researchers are writing much of this stuff, and you're also teaching it. Wouldn't you be interested in partnering on, on, on the launch of, of, of resources like this? Sort of similar to an, an agreement between a society and a publisher. And we've had a positive response for that. Um, and so that's what's going to, to happen next. Let's uh, jump straight into uh, global perspectives. So next slide. Here we go. So global perspectives, right? What is it? Well, in its simplest form, it's a journal with peer-reviewed articles with annotations uh, around it, uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary annotations. So imagine you have an article and it's on a, on a core topic. Um, that core topic will typically be very focused on sort of 
uh, addressing the interests of people in a particular field. But the topic itself, and maybe if it's in a global issue, right, uh, has a lot of perspectives from people in other disciplines. And one way this was highlighted during the market research uh, was, I was having a conversation with, uh, with a guy. He's, a, he's in the legal field, uh, mass atrocities, particularly in Africa. Uh, and he told this story about uh, how uh, he and his spouse uh, have these dinner conversations. She's an anthropologist. Uh, and uh, also with a focus on, 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 on Eastern Africa. And they, they, they were just sort of uh, dumbfounded sometimes by conversations they would have uh, sort of randomly about articles or you know, uh, new experiences in, in their respective fields that they didn't know about in each other's fields, even though it was really about the same country, the same events, the same people, right? But there was just this, this, this siloed approach to, uh, to, to writing and consuming uh, knowledge in these uh, spaces. So, you know, we all know that it's super difficult to create multidisciplinary journals, right? Because no one wants to uh, submit some, you know, credit. There, there, there's a host of issues that just make it, 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 it difficult to launch. It's also difficult to go out and ask authors to write an interdisciplinary article, right? Because it becomes very long, it goes all over the place. So what we thought of was, well, what if we, um, we, 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 we created verticals, sort of similar to what you saw with case studies environment, right, uh, that were subject specific. Um, and then we, we had a process for inviting and vetting uh, annotations on top of that. So if you go to the next slide, I, I'll start illustrating what we're talking about. So this thing isn't launched yet, right? So um, try and jump to the next slide. There. So to, to give you an idea, right? So imagine you have like several verticals in a journal. This one is on environmental issues. You'll see a bigger view in a, in a second, right? So the section is, is, is sort of the top layer. That's, that's sort of the primary way of organizing your content. And then you have these articles. Uh, and, and here you could have a, a, an environmental article written by maybe an environmental studies or sciences person. And then we would invite you know, three to four uh, annotations uh, from scholars and other disciplines, right? So you could get maybe a religious perspective, an economic perspective, maybe something north, global, south, uh, and maybe an NGO uh, perspective on the environmental studies or sciences uh, article. So it's a way of, of, of trying to say, well, this, this article in itself is interesting, right? But if we publish it in a traditional way, only people in that particular field are likely to find it. But people in other fields, especially on this topic, right, will have uh, some to say about that. Um, but their voices are sort of disappearing. Um, so that was the way. And if you jump to the next slide, here, that's sort of illustrating this in, a, in, a, in an expanded way, right? So you can imagine a journal with, with multiple verticals, conflict, security, environmental issues, justice, legal, media, religion, global health, uh, governance, uh, NGOs. There are different ways of, 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 of slicing the cake. And, and between those, you could also create sort of virtual tracks, right? So you could have articles about water uh, in, in all those uh, sections, uh, but this is a way of uh, tying them together, uh, partially through the, uh, the annotations. And that leaves 50 seconds, and I think that's it if you go to the last slide. That's it, really. So it was very compressed, and I think it was more like sort of a, a show and tell of, of a couple of new models that are you know, really doing something, it's a mix, it's something fairly traditional, mixed with just a twist, right? Uh, so traditional article publication, but with some complements uh, around those articles uh, to broaden the impact. So, uh, what, uh, oh, we do have questions. Good. Um, a microphone? Thanks. And I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Hi. Like um, we're doing something similar with the journal, the plant cell, but I think yeah. there's some differences. Um, so your case study journal is only case studies, right? It's not also research articles and things. No, the only other uh, content type is we have a content type called case study pedagogy, right? So the idea is you could do case studies, but if you want to share some thoughts about learning in general, that's more focused on on addressing your colleagues rather than students. You can publish those to you. Yeah. Our issue is that we're trying not to have these rarely cited articles affect ah. the impact factor, so we package them as sort of editorial content. Yeah. Um, 
And the other question was, do you have author page charges for these, or do you publish them free for the author and you just get your revenue from subscriptions? Yeah, the, these are both uh, subscription uh, uh, products. Uh, they're both, they're, there's, a, there's a trial uh, period, right? So they're both free until they're scaled enough to have content that justifies charging. Uh, so there are no charges uh, to the authors. Uh, case studies environment has an open access component in the slide cases in that we said, well, when we take in an article, right, we do the peer review, the types and the format. There, there's a lot of work that goes into that. And so for that, we need to charge subscriptions. However, when you send us an independent slide, what do we do? We don't really do anything, right? Uh, yeah, we, we, we do some, some formatting, right? But, you know, e either it's accepted or it isn't. It's more like a preprint. So for those, uh, those are published at open access and you pick which license you want. For the other content, you're gonna have to sign a, you know, a, a UC Regents uh, standard copyright license. For the annotated uh, journal, the articles are subscribed, right? The, the annotations, uh, at least where we are now with this technology, they're not subscribed, right? Uh, and uh, the logic is, well, uh, yeah, they're, 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 they would be freely available, but they wouldn't really make sense unless you have an article anyway, so it's sort of safe for the, for the sustainability of the model, yeah? I, I thought the interesting combination of, of the, the two in one in the case studies that essentially the community can contribute slide decks. Uh, and, and it goes into this overall structure, which is organized. You have a, you know, the subject uh, taxonomy. I thought that was really interesting and unusual. Yeah. So we have two questions, three questions. So Andrew, just uh, piggybacking on what you just said, yeah. are you, is it standard licensing for everything or just for the peer-reviewed material? Uh, and what are they, what kind of charges, are you charging anything for yeah. that? Yeah, so, I mean, so, yes, we, we, have a, we have a University of California Regents copyright license that we're mandated to use with all the, 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 the content for the things that are peer reviewed here, um, but the things that are editorially vetted, right, um, like the annotations or the slides, they don't go out for external peer review and we don't, you know, spend money on copy editing or sending it to typesetters who say, that we don't really add much value. We, we, we facilitate, for sure, right? But uh, it's, not a, it's not a facilitation we wanna charge for. So there's like that uh, hybrid component in, in the content. And, and the charges, um, it, it varies uh, for these products. I mean, they're, they're pricier, right? The, the typical University of California Press Journal is something like three to $400 an institution a year. Uh, but these come in at, at just shy of 2,000, so 1,950 or so. That's the, the standard price. And then there's some discounting for, for differently sized institution and packages and all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely a pricier project, um, but it is also a more costly one, right? Because we, yeah, we actually have to pay the editors uh, uh, you know, at, at a decent uh, amount of money to do all this, uh, this work, because there's a lot of like concept development and solicitation and, and wrapping their heads around completely new types of, of, of content. Monica? Yeah. My question was, um, how do you motivate the people to do the annotations? It's a good question, because we don't know yet, right? We hope that we will. It was interesting. We, I mean, we should never trust market research fully, right? Because as an example, when we did the market research for case studies environment, a lot of people said, if I could only upload my slides, I would upload several uh, tomorrow, right? And then we lost, and then we wrote the people and said, oh, you know, you spoke, we answered, here it is, silence, right? So you never quite know. People will tell you, oh, I need this, right? And then you give it to them, they're like, eh, you know. So, and so maybe there's also some, you know, some people are sort of looking at it and it'll take some, some, some time. With annotations, we did similar market research. And interestingly enough, when we, when we asked people, you know, about their willingness to write uh, a core article or annotate the core article, uh, I think it was something like 63% said they would be willing to write an article, but 67% said they'd uh, be willing to annotate. So, I mean, we don't know how many would actually do it, right? But relatively, we could say the willingness is at least as good as for writing an article. And many of the people said, you know, because um, I would never want to spend time on writing uh, a core article in a journal of a different uh, discipline, right? Because I'm not reaching my peers. But if you're asking me to go in and annotate what I feel is an interesting article, and annotating meaning 
can I write like various uh, annotations in a combined length of maybe 1,500 words? I'd be happy to, because to me that's sort of that's intellectually stimulating. But you know, we, we just don't know until we launch. Uh, we have a good feeling, but that's not enough. John. So my question is also about motivation. Yeah. And how do you motivate people to write the articles in the first place? And when you talk about extending the concept into other fields, yeah. are you looking for fields in which case reports are, are already a sort of recognized yeah. form of communication? Or are you going to expect people to sort of rethink how they communicate? Yeah, that's one of these things where uh, you want to try something new and you don't want to sort of push the envelope too much, right? Because yeah, you, you need the willingness of, of, of people to participate. Uh, so no, we are looking particularly at fields where we can see, you know what, when we go into, uh, in, into the lecture rooms, the way this topic is taught always includes some sort of case. Cases illustrate the point, right? So those are the areas where we're like, there's something here, right? The issue is that in many of those fields, there, there isn't like a, you know, a, a, a one-stop shop for where you go find cases. Like many people say, oh, I, I use this case, right? And it's and it's and it's a it's an article from New York Times. And and, and then I've I, you know I've added my own storytelling to it. And you're like, well, you know, that's that's fine, right? But you could you could make that a bit more authoritative. You could you could vet it, right? You could make sure that other people could use it, and you could get some sort of recognition for for writing it up. And we spend a lot of energy on, it, at least at launch, at uh, soliciting, right? So working with the editors and through the editors' networks to send out invitations. Uh, we, we, we have this like uh, model assumption that's actually working out fairly precisely now. Roughly a third come in over the transom, at least now, right? We're in the launch year, and two thirds are through uh, solicitation. I mean, the idea is, of course, as a journal matures, right, that then you see a, a a transom growth, and, and then you know the editors can relax a bit and not have to, you know, solicit as as much. Um, but you know that that's at least where we are right now. Um, and of course, you know, you mentioned it before, impact factors and stuff like that. That would be lovely, but we know already this this is not something that's being cited, right? Uh, this this is a this is more a learning tool. Richard, last question. Yeah. Um, so uh, I always kind of joke about supplementary data that it's unrefereed, unindexed, and unread. Uh -huh. So you mentioned that you are adding um, abstracts to the slide deck uh -huh. so they could be discovered. What um, what are your criteria there? Because it it seems like one of the values of this could be that you know deep in those slides there's information that will, people would come mm -hmm. across in a search. But I would worry that that information might not appear in the abstract. Yeah, I, that, that's true. I mean, uh, I, I guess it's like any abstract, right? It, it, it's uh, there, there is a there is a there is a task there to how do you write a good abstract that brings out sort of all the pertinent points of, of the content that that, that follows. Yeah, I mean, but but you you, you can still search. I mean, it's a, it's a PDF, right? So you could still search the, uh, the, the, the text of the, of the slide, but the abstract just helps you, you know, when, when you see it, you know, to explain what is this, right? Because people make decisions very quickly about what they want to read or not. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thanks. <laughs>
the question, why? You know, we're not trying to emulate my children. Uh, we're, we're actually very interested in understanding what your issues are um, so that we can provide you with the very best solutions. Uh, now, with a consultant in my job title, it would be remiss of me not to put a virtuous circle up on the screen. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is one that, again, we, we show in a number of uh, our presentations. Uh, it's one that we do hark back to on many occasions, even though it's gone quite skewy. That in our process, you know, we're very keen on understanding that we, we need to gather information from as many sources as possible, uh, that we understand the issues. And then once we have understood the issues, we can identify the potential solutions. Um, those are validated against the, you know, and quantify the impact that they may have. Uh, and then when we take action to, uh, to implement those solutions, that we are also able to measure uh, the effectiveness of that so that we can actually validate that we are on an actual continuous improvement cycle. And at Stanford and London, uh, we looked at Google Analytics in a bit more detail. That you know, we still think that's a fantastic tool for uh, measuring effects of change and also gathering information on how users behave on your site. Um, but obviously, it's not the complete picture. And so today, I'd just really like to look at well, what are those other sources that may be available to you? Uh, and once you've got that information, you know, how do we how do we rationalise that? How do we uh, prioritize the solutions that we've put in place uh, to create a positive change. Ah, there we go. So as part of that, so, so for us, we take a very pragmatic view here. So um, we want to capture information from any sources that you have available. Um, you know, there are some uh, areas that we like ourselves and we would recommend, but you know we will take a very pragmatic view. So if you have certain data available, uh, we put it into the mix, into the pot uh, to assess it. <clears throat> but it is quite key to try and have something from each of these sort of four key areas that, that we highlight here. Um, obviously, the business aspect, that's crucial to us. That's not, you know, that's rarely something that we can impart on you, you know, we need you to be involved in this and give us the, the context within which changes uh, are looking to be uh, implemented. <clears throat> Expert opinion, so we can provide some of that from a, from a web development standpoint, but also experts in your field, in your content area. Uh, of course, understanding that the user is at the heart of any of these changes and the decisions that we're making. So capturing user feedback and, and understanding what users are, are, are looking for is a, is a key aspect as well. And finally, that we can search out and analyze data sources to uh, back up uh, any of the thought processes uh, and the solutions that we are defining. So from that mix, we then identify solutions. Um, invariably, there could be a number of issues that have been identified. Uh, each issue could have one or more solutions. You know, th there's always many, many ways to, to solve a problem. Um, and so <clears throat> we then try and map that into a, you know, a cost-benefit analysis, really look at, from our standpoint, from as a technology vendor, we can advise you on the feasibility uh, and, many, and, and any alternative solutions or tools or third parties that could help out. Uh, and yourselves as the, uh, as the publisher, you can ascertain the, the business benefit. And then we can map this out together. We can identify those that are you know, the no-brainers. These are the ones that we get such a bang for buck for that would be uh, stupid not to implement. Those that we highlight as being you know, really not worth the, the cost of implementation. And of course, there'll be some that are in that sort of gray area or amber area uh, that, that means you, you really want to assess that in a bit more detail. Some you'll put into the pot and some you will exclude. Okay, so with the, with the backdrop of that as our sort of general process, uh, let's have a look at what might be some data sources that are out there. And you know, if you have access to these, making them available to us when we engage with you is just going to be beneficial uh, to get the right outcomes. Or 
or not. There we go. <coughs> now, as I said earlier, the, you know, the business side, you know, that's the key part that, that you bring to the equation. Of course, you know, quite often we would have people say, I don't know, maybe they come along to us and say, let's have a big flashing red button or a cardinal button, as we, uh, <laughs> as we established yesterday. Um, but without us understanding why that big flashing red button needs to be placed on the, on the page, we can't help you and advise you and say, well, you know, maybe it shouldn't be flashing, it should be, you know, uh, subtly highlighted or it should be placed in a different location. So we want to understand why is that button need to be flashing today? You know, is that for is that for an editorial impact? Are you trying to attract authors? Are you trying to, you know, maybe create a, a younger image on the site? Uh, is it to have a financial impact? You know, get somebody more people to buy some content from you? Uh, is there a society or a community aspect to this? Are you trying to change the the outlook of your website within your own community, uh, you know, and, and giving something back in that, that aspect. Then sort of ex experts in the field. Now we can bring, so, you know, we will bring from a technology standpoint, so we can advise as to what are the pragmatic ways to implement a solution. Uh, through our partner program, we can also advise on what other tools and services there may be to achieve the goals that you know, we have established with yourselves. Uh, we can also, from a design standpoint, you know, we have a team of user experience experts back at, at the office that can advise on best practices in placement and labeling and, uh, you know, and and certain interactions that we provide on the on the front end of the website, and of course, you know we can pull in uh, experiences from the the wider web community. You know, take for example, the the research that Google undertook with the the, the magic triangle. The, when Google first came out, there was this uh, theory that people looked at a golden triangle, just the top left hand corner, the first three results from a, from a search index. And that was almost like an established industry norm for many, many years. And then, of course, mobile devices came along. Um, people interact with content differently. People's experiences change over time. Uh, and so a revised study of the same topic then looked, well, you know, the, the magic triangle was no longer magic, and instead it was a, quite a steady column. And so people do browse search results to the bottom quite often these days because they, they are used to scrolling through mobile devices and they also appreciate that there's a lot of contest to be number one and that the searches lower down in the rankings can be as important as those at the top. So there are many, many sources that can inform expert opinion that you can put into the pool and make an informed decision on the changes you make to your site. Now, of course, users, um, as I said, you know, this is really something that you know, we find key and core to our principles, that whenever we make a change, we always want to consider the end user and that they are the heart of any design decisions. And so getting feedback from users, you know, it's something we want to hear about, and, and it can come from a number of sources. Uh, focus groups are okay. You know, they can be very good at providing uh, sort of a general overview, a, a very much a generalistic um, impression of your website. The danger with focus groups is that just that because of the, the function, the way that they perform, um, they can be very influenced by that herd mentality, and so people won't challenge the uh, dominant personalities in the room. So whilst they're pretty useful uh, to get an overview, um, we find that user testing and user interviews are much more um, are much more qualitative. So within uh, user testing, we can provide one-on-one -on -one interviews with some uh, general users. We can do that remotely over the web. And uh, it's much more of a, an exploratory sort of interview, so we can really delve in and ask people why they click in certain areas of the page, you know, ask people what they're looking for, what are their what are they considering? What is their thought process whilst they're looking at your site? <clears throat> Which is something that's very hard to capture through analytics and, and other tools. 
And of course, look at your other feedback sources, um, your support tickets, uh, your, your responses on the Contact Us pages. You know, make sure that all of those considerations are included. And then, of course, the, the sort of the pure data aspects as well. Um, looking at your sort of identity and access management systems, uh, your, your CRMs, you know, <clears throat> are there ways to um, sort of engage the measurement in certain groups or certain um, uh, demographic within your user base? And ensuring that that information, as we talked about in the Google Analytics piece, uh, that that information, you, you really want to try and bake that into your web analytics so that you're not always looking at a, 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 a you know, the, the entire populace at any one time. You have the ability to segment out, you know, subscriber versus non-subscriber, people that purchase individually versus those that come in via an institution. You know, there are, there are many, many authors versus readers. You know, there are many, many different aspects and ways to slice up that data um, that can inform different areas of your website, um, ensure that they're performing for target audiences. Uh, usage data is also uh, a key one, just to help with the KPI measurements, ensuring that the, uh, you know, the usage essentially affects your bottom line. So that's usually a key metric to ensure that's going up, and we can see what, uh, what aspects of the website are, are influencing that in a positive way. And platform analytics as well. So, you know, this is something which we can help with. You obviously know how much uh, people are using the site, but how's that interesting and, like, blended in with how much of people are using personalization features? How many people are uh, requesting alerts? How many people are commenting on, on pieces of content? And all of that creates an interesting picture so that we know when we're making a change to the website that we're, we're having positive or negative impacts on these various areas. Now, last time we spoke about the, uh, the Google Analytics piece, and since then, uh, we've had a lot of interest and we've done uh, a number of engagements with people around Crazy Egg. So, I just wanted to highlight this. You know, it's obviously not the only tool that's out there, but it is a very interesting tool to, um, to look at whenever we are making a change to a website. So <coughs> Google Analytics provides a lot of information, um, but the way that, that Crazy Egg represents that makes it much more accessible. So you can look at Google Analytics, you can pour through a report, and you can see what links people click upon um, to, to end up at various segments of your site. But with the Crazy Egg uh, heat map, which is this top left corner here, um, this really gives you um, a fantastic way to see very quickly what are the areas of your website that people uh, are interacting with. Where, where are they clicking? Um, what can be very interesting are the, you know, the dark areas of that page as much as the light areas. So if this, if this image was a click through to something uh, very important, you know, we can see that that's not, people aren't realizing that they can click on that. The next one that's uh, also interesting that Google doesn't really provide in a very nice way is, is scroll depth. So you can see how many people visit a page, um, but it's also incredibly interesting to see whereabouts on that page people read to. Uh, so in certain instances, you know, we, we've looked at some publishers where their home page is read all the way to the bottom, and there's, there's a very equal amount of uh, eyeballs across the entire page, and that's fantastic. So that means that when they place uh, content or editorial uh, information on the home page, they know that wherever they put it, it can be very, uh, very likely to be read. Whereas others, we can see that only the top third of the page is ever viewed, and, and less than 10% of people scroll down to the bottom. And so, you know, that means that you really have to consider where you place your content. Um, or whether you break it up into sub-pages, et cetera. Okay. Uh, this one over here, so the confetti map. This is actually uh, a more detailed view of the heat map. So it's, instead of showing sort of uh, density of clicks, it actually shows you every individual click on a particular page. <clears throat> and you can actually also slice and dice this by a whole bunch of different um, uh, views on the data. So 
how people interact with the site on Monday versus a Friday, uh, what time of a day people will interact with the site, how many seconds it takes for somebody to click on a particular element. So there's a lots of really useful information in there that just adds a, a new layer, a new uh, level of insight that you may get just from your analytics. Uh, and then finally, uh, th this is a sort of a more detailed view of the confetti where all of those links and clicks are um, gathered together by the actionable elements on your website. So you can see which of your elements that people can actually interact with, how popular they are. Um, there's also a, a, a negative view of that as well, which is really interesting, where it actually will show you areas on the website that people have been desperately trying to click, um, and it's not uh, performing any action. So, you know, in many instances, that can just be that they're <clears throat> they haven't had a cup of coffee and they're they're clicking t too far right on a particular image, um, or it can actually highlight that you know there's a certain area of your page that people are, are desperately you know, thinking that it will take them a call to action, uh, but it actually takes them nowhere. So that's a, that's a tool we're finding a lot of interest in at the moment, and we'd be uh, very happy to talk to you more about. And then finally, just a very simple example to try and pull that together <coughs> and just try to explain our, our sort of thought processes. Uh, so somebody comes to us and, look, not enough users are purchasing content on our site. Um, you know, we have a business goal to, to sell more content via e-commerce. What's going on? Uh, we can look at Google Analytics and we can see that, well, people are walking away at a, a pic particular page, a particular phase in, in that funnel and that goal completion. Um, so they're actually getting to the point where they are able to purchase, but for, for, for reasons yet to be known, um, they are walking away. Uh, we could then look at crazy and say, okay, well, <clears throat> we know that people are getting to the purchase page. Maybe the location of that button uh, is hidden away, but no, we see here that the, uh, the white hot area is showing that, well, no, the purchase button is, is visible by the large proportion of the users on the website. And we also see that people are interacting actually with a button very near to the purchase button. So it's visible, people are finding it, um, but they're not paying any attention to it. So we can sort of hypothesize, okay, well, people find, <coughs> find the page, um, but they find the buy button, um, you know, it's almost like invisible to them. They can't actually notice it. So invariably, as I said, there are, there are always many ways to solve a particular problem. <clears throat> it could be that the button is too small. And so we uh, look at solutions to increase the size. It could be that the contrast is too low, so it, it's just blurring into the background. It could be that it's in the wrong place. People are, <clears throat> are not ex finding it where they expect it, or it's in a place of the page where they don't actually interact with. Or that the button could have the wrong label. And so people are, are, don't find it obvious as to if I click on that area, what is the expectation? So through the, looking at those various uh, options, <coughs> we determine, well, you know, it's got industry standard size and labeling. It's very consistent with what we see uh, out on the web today. Uh, our analytics, you know, our, our view of Crazy Egg shows that the placement is being seen by the, the large proportion of the users. Um, therefore, you know, we can make a, an informed decision that it's likely that it's just not popping out on the screen enough. Uh, it's not flashing red. <laughs> so we determine that the contrast needs adjusting. Of course, to adjust the contrast, we can uh, make a modification just to the button itself. Or we can look at the, the aspects around it so the, the current button coloring um, pops out a bit more. Uh, obviously, the first one is the smaller, the t-shirt sized smaller option versus the large change. And so that's the one that we advise to the publisher to implement, which of course results in some fantastic uplift in, <laughs> in sales. <laughs> Everyone's happy and it's a, it's a fantastic result. So, Obviously, a very contrived example, but just hopefully that shows you know, why we keep asking why 
um, and how looking at all of these data points and these opinions and, and information from many, many areas, you know, across your business, our business, and from the users um, are harmonized and come together to provide a positive result. Thank you. Uh, questions. Uh, Colin, uh, what's the, the right time for somebody to, to call uh, the consultancy group and uh, say, yeah, we'd like to use, have you set up Crazy Egg and, and configure Google Analytics so we can study something? When should? Um, as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> honestly, um, you know, with a lot of these tools, they, they have to be in place in order to gather the data that, that can then be assessed. Mm -hmm. you know, but also, we're, we're very pragmatic about this approach. We want to put the tools in place, help you get set up so that it can be part of your ongoing process rather than always having to come and speak to us. So uh, if you're planning a redesign in mid-2018, maybe call early 2018 to get it configured and gathering some data so that you'll have some longitudinal exactly. data. You know, but, but also, it doesn't have to be uh, directly related to website changes. So mm -hmm. you know, those tools can also help with editorial content and you know, advertising placement, et cetera. Yeah, we, we've used them in the past to, to inform our, our general decision making at Highwire uh, about how to design certain jCore templates, for example, where to put things on the page so that they get the right attention. Uh, but if you've got a custom design, uh, then, of course, we don't have that that data unless we configure the tools. I can show you some pretty interesting stuff. Um, uh, one of the, the general critiques I, uh, I'd, I'd say happens uh, is feature creep. You know, it, it, every time you meet with the editorial board, somebody says, oh, we need a, you know, a new feature on the site. We need to add a button that does X. And it just gets put in at the top, which pushes the content farther down the page. And, and that has, that heat map will pretty quickly show mm. that's a bad uh, outcome, especially if you incrementally make it happen, you don't quite notice that it's uh, how bad it yeah, is. Yeah, very much so. Um, you know, in, in a, I think in the previous presentation on Google Analytics, we, we sh sort of showed that where one of our publishers had, you know, spent a, you know, quite a considerable amount of investment to create some very unique features on their website. Um, but, and when it came to a, a refresh of that website, uh, we looked at the analytics to help the project team identify that only, say, 25% of those features were being used mm -hmm. so they could reinvest the saved money in other areas. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a... a Break now, uh, a 25 minutes break. Uh, we'll get back together in this room at uh, 1025. See you then. <laughs>